Hello everybody. This is our lecture on integrated pest management. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about pests. Now um, one thing that uh, is interesting in terms of pests is the idea that this is something that um, both in areas that are natural and areas that are artificial it is problematic. So um, by the idea of, of artificial, meaning that it's not only a problem in forests and rangelands, but it's also a problem in our um, agricultural areas as well, as we've got agricultural pests, we've got forest pests, we've got um, grassland pests, and we've got, uh, it, there are all sorts of different types of pests. So let's, let's figure out what a pest is. So uh, when we're defining a uh, pest and what a pest is, our, our definition is going to be that pests are organisms that damage or interfere with desirable plants in our fields and orchards, landscapes or wildlands, or they damage homes and structures. That's going to be our full definitions of pests. Um, these may include organisms that can impact human health or humans themselves. Uh, they may transmit disease. They may just be a nuisance. Uh, and they're all sorts of things. So um, just because we use the word pest, most people think insects. But we're talking about plants, um, weeds. Lots of weeds fall in that category. We're talking about vertebrates, things with the, things with the spine. So birds, rodents, uh, other mammals like uh, pigs. Uh, Feral hogs are quite a quite a big pest, uh, especially in the southeastern United States. Uh, invertebrate animals that those are the, or invertebrate organisms those are the ones we are most used to when we think of pests. So insects, ticks, mites, uh, snails. Uh, there's also nematodes. There's pathogens like bacteria, viruses, and fungi, fungi or or some fungus. Uh, that cause disease or any other unwanted organisms. Um, things that may harm water quality, things that may harm animal life, or really any parts of the ecosystem. Things that are causing harm to the ecosystem are pests. And so anything that's interfering with what we consider desirable, which um, for us in natural resources is just the idea of a healthy ecosystem, those are gonna be our pests. So in terms of pesticides, uh, about 2.7 million tons every year. Now this uh, number comes from from uh, our book, and our book is uh, about a decade old, so it's probably larger than that uh, at at this time. Uh, and why why would we spray something like pesticides, which are um, you know something that exists to get rid of pests? Well, we're trying to protect our fruits and vegetables. Uh, we're trying to protect our livestock, lawns, trees, golf courses, swamps, pastures, forest, just our neighborhoods. There's all sorts of reason that um, that we're spraying for pesticides. But if we're spay spraying something that is supposed to be killing um, plants and bacteria and viruses and funguses and animals, including other mammals, then it's something that we really need to be uh, cognizant about and we really need to know uh, what's happening and know the ideas behind it to make sure that we're doing it right because it's something that could uh, potentially be harmful to us in some cases. It's also really important to understand that pests are a natural part of the ecosystem. They're a natural disturbance and um, with what what we understand about uh, the forest and about rangelands in terms of our natural settings, our wildlands, is that um, disturbance is a good thing. Uh, disturbance, as we know from uh, understanding succession, is a natural part of succession. It's just uh, a, something that causes a temporary change in the ecosystem and in a lot of cases will um, will just knock it back to an earlier serial stage. And so pests aren't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, pests are one of the reasons why when we look at nature, we see kind of a mosaic landscape. We don't see just here is one big, huge swath of forest and it's all the same trees. We see some different trees. We see some areas with grass. We see some areas with big trees, some areas with little trees. And part of that is due to pests and the disturbance 
of pets with a few trees here or a few trees there or this plant here, that sort of a thing. It's, um, they keep us from ecosystem simplification. They keep us from a monoculture where the food web gets destroyed because that's, that's not what we're looking for in most cases. Now in agriculture, that is the easiest way to grow something is to set up the soil so that it grows one specific crop and grows it um, really well and we and we figure out how best to to deal with just that one uh, crop but the problem that happens to that is uh, or what happens to when we do that to the land is then the land becomes only used to to uh, that particular uh, organism or plant that um, that we've got in it uh, we end up with the loss of natural predators we end up uh, with uh, all, we can end up with problems in the ground. We can um, possibly not, uh, depending on how hard we're, uh, we're using the land. Uh, but the biggest thing is we get rid of that complex food web and we get rid of all the other things in the ecosystem. So now the ecosystem becomes dependent on one organism. Let's just say like a cornfield, for example. So uh, if if we have some sort of a pest that then comes in and affects the corn well what happens is that whole field will go down or maybe that whole farm will go down because that's all that's there there is nothing else because maybe maybe if there's some insect or uh, fungus that affects the corn maybe it, maybe if it was corn and barley and lettuce and tomatoes and all we did was lose the corn no big deal we got the barley and the lettuce and the tomatoes and and it's not a big deal but because it's the same plant, it becomes this unlimited food supply for this pest. Um, it's a problem actually that we're seeing uh, with the uh, with the overcrowding of the forests in the West, and why we're having uh, large swaths of forest being killed due to beetle kill. Um, bark beetles are a natural part of the ecosystem. Uh, of the of the of pine trees in the western United States, the problem is that um, bark beetles usually they come around, they uh, they do a little bit of damage. It gets too cold, the bark beetles all die off, and then the cycle resets itself. But the problem is it hasn't been we haven't been getting cold enough winters to kill off the bark beetles because uh, the the temperature of the planet has been slowly increasing due to climate change and then also um, the idea is that there's more and more trees available to them and because we have more and more trees they're more and more crowded trees which means we also have problems with the trees not being um, at full health we've got a lot more where you've got some because of the crowding of the trees you've got um, some more trees that are intermediate or suppressed trees so they are trees that are stuck underneath the canopy so they're they're not growing the way that they should so maybe they're they're having some issues or they're already dying off early and they're becoming good hosts for the bark beetles and a, and a good place for the bark beetles to be able to live and hatch and uh and create larger populations and so it's a really big uh issue in terms of uh, out here in California, especially in the Sierra Nevadas, with uh, losing millions and millions of trees to to bark beetle problems. But the the idea with bark beetles uh, that's important to remember is they're a natural pest. They are they're good disturbance to have sometimes when they're in a small controllable number when they're not um, taking out huge huge swaths of millions and millions of trees. And so it's it's really important to to manage pests as best we can, but also to understand that they are a natural part of the ecosystem. I'm going to move myself down here out of the way. So um, exotic species. Now this to me is where uh, the idea of pests really get interesting and really uh, this is the main crux of the problem for me. So an exotic species is a non-native species that's introduced from another area. And exotic species are extremely problematic. And if you ask me 
um, what's the number one problem facing forests in the United States? To me, as forests and rangelands, to me, it's exotic species. That's, that is a huge issue. It's leading to degradation of a lot of these areas. It's leading to um, smaller populations of native species. It's leading to um, problems with uh, fire. Uh, especially in um, like um, chaparral shrublands and uh, grasslands out west where we get fires um, that happen and then uh, we're getting, you know, 90% of what comes back are uh, exotic and invasive species. Uh, almost 40% of the southeast in terms of USDA uh, forest inventory and analysis plots come back showing um, some form of exotic species in them. So you're talking about, you know, um, basically you're saying half the areas where they've got plots, they have exotic species. And I've attached uh, an article to that data as well as um, this map here on the right hand side to kind of paint that picture for you. Uh, Hawaii um, is, an, is interesting because of all the travel and all the tourism. Hawaii has so many exotic species that um, that uh, I believe the number is seventy percent. So um, more than more than seventy percent of Hawaii is uh, covered with exotic species. Uh, interesting enough, that's actually why a lot of movies are filmed in Hawaii because people can't tell where it is. Could you be somewhere in the Pacific Island? Sure. Could you be um, somewhere? Uh, off the coast of Africa, sure. But there's a lot of you can't really tell where where you are because you have all these plants that are growing from all these different areas. So Hawaii gets used in a lot of movies because it can be almost anywhere. Um, but the big the big thing with exotic species is the idea that um, because because these species have come into these areas from other areas, it means that they're tough. It means that they, they don't go away easy. It means that they are uh, heavy colonizers who, and they have some sort of uh, strength to them that allows them to not be killed or not go away. Um, one, one instance of this is uh, um, pampas grass, which uh, was used by Caltrans along the highways to uh, prevent erosion. And they found this plant, pampas grass, that they can they could uh, plant along the highways, and it was great at uh, preventing erosion. And so they did, weren't having these big, huge problems with erosion. But the problem with pampas grass is the reason that you don't have problems with erosion is because once it goes in there, it stays in there, and it's hard to get rid of. You can't cut it out. You can't uh, poison it out with pesticides. You can't burn it away. There, it's very hard to get rid of. Um, kudzu is a big one in the southeastern United States where I've driven pat, um, along the sides of highways and just seen nothing but kudzu, kudzu for, for miles. And so these plant, these plant species or um, even these um, fungus species or diseases, whatever that we've brought in from all these other areas, uh, they're extremely pro problematic. Some ecosystems have been changed. Uh, completely. Uh, one of the big things uh, that I hear lately from people is they're talking about the the fire regimes in California and we're getting these huge mega fires now these days and why are we getting these huge mega fires and why are they happening so often? Well one of the reasons is climate change. One of the reasons is the idea that that the ecosystem has changed. It's not the same ecosystem. We have way more people and we sometimes can almost be an exotic species in, in some of these areas. Um, and then also the idea that we're, there's a lot of exotic species, especially in our, our what used to be native grasslands and native rangelands have been dominated now by exotic species, which changes the fire regime. The, they're, they're species that, um, that can, they're hardier than some of the stuff or, and, um, there's, it's really problematic because um, it's almost there's almost a point as to as when is when is it too much? When is an exotic species no longer an exotic species and it's just there because it's been there so long? It, it becomes an, 
an interesting dilemma to deal with when you're thinking about it from a management perspective. Uh, just to give you a couple examples, so the gypsy moth was introduced in 1869 from Europe as a disease-resistant silkworm moth. And so uh, one caterpillar can eat uh, one square meter of foliage a day. So oak, birch, ash, and even pine uh, trees all have problems with gyp gypsy moth. They get um, several repeated seasons of defoliation where the gypsy moth just eats all the leaves. And if you have no leaves, you have no photosynthesis, which means you have no energy, which means you are starting, you're just on a, the way to death because you can't create any energy. And so here is a map from the U.S. Department of Agriculture talking about the uh, quarantine areas. So uh, counties that are quarantined prior to 2006. So you can see the whole Northeast has a huge uh, problem with, with gypsy moth. And you can see all these other areas now that they're starting to add as well that they're trying to, they're really trying to prevent the spread of gypsy moth. Dutch elm disease was a huge problem, it had a huge effect on and basically changed the, the forests of eastern North America. So it, in 1933, it was a fungus from Europe that was accidentally uh, infecting uh, elm trees. And so American elm uh, was the one that was hit. Uh, the, the worst is the one that hit the worst by it. It's the uh, ideal... Uh, eastern United States tree species. It's a, it's a great, uh, shade, shade tree, uh, kind of lines a lot of the streets. And so, uh, Dutch elm disease is this, um, it's, it's this fungus that, that, um, basically gets the, the elm tree to kill itself, uh, trying to fight off the fungus. So the, the elm tree will release chemicals to fight the infection. But the, in releasing those chemicals, they actually clog the vessels that carry the water up from the roots, which stops the photosynthetic process. And the, this fungus basically gets the tree to kill itself. And um, that's problematic. It's really problematic because it's a um, American elm is a fast-growing, long-lived, tolerant of compacted soils and air pollution tree. It's a great um, tree that uh, is quite popular and... Uh, it's getting killed off by this disease. And so uh, you can see the historical distribution. So it started off kind of in the um, Ohio Valley area and then slowly just started moving its way out to all the way into the 2000s. Now it, uh, Dutch elm disease is all the way up in Canada as well as has made its way to the western United States. So those were just two examples. There are many, many more. Didn't even get into all the uh, the crops and all of their all all of the different pests that affect crops. Um, but we're just going to talk about pest management in general and um, and how we can deal with pests uh, from a more broad perspective. And the way that we're going to do that is through the term integrated pest management. So what does integrated pest management or IPM mean? Well, it's a process you can use to solve pest problems while minimizing risk to the people and environment, or that's at least the goal. Uh, you want IPM um, to be used to manage all kinds of pests anywhere, whether this, whether you're talking urban, agricultural, or wildland natural areas, it shouldn't matter because the idea is we're, we're integrating our process. We're bringing in um, all sorts of solutions and looking at it from all sorts of different angles to making make sure we're causing the, uh, we're, we're trying to get rid of a problem, but not by causing more problems or making problems worse in any way. And we know when we've talked about that before, the nemesis effect, that that can be really difficult uh, to to deal with and when we start compiling problems on top of problems. And so integrated pest management is just going to be this idea of um, bringing in everything that we can to, to try and implement uh, a, a, a pest program. So looking at this uh, graphic on the left. 
what goes into integrated pest management. Identification of the pest, weather forecasting to make sure that when we're applying pesticides that we're doing it right and we get minimal amounts of drift and any other things that could take the pesticides to the uh, to the to non-affected areas or areas where they won't be as as effective. Uh, we're going to plan according to our thresholds. We're going to implement our different IPM controls or different types of controls, which we'll talk about in in a little bit of detail. Or oh, we're going to keep record good records to make sure that we know what's working, what's not, and when we did um, all of our different tactics. We're going to evaluate how it was going, and then we're going to inspect and monitor. And so we can kind of see that same thing here on the right hand side. We're going to identify what's happening. We're going to monitor it. We're going to do some sort of mitigated, mitigative action. We're going to evaluate whether that mitigation worked and then we're going to inspect and then we're going to kind of keep going. And so if we really break down the three words, the integrated pest management, integrated means composed of separate parts united together to form a more complete and compatible unit. Pest is an organism that reduces availability, quality, or value of some natural resource, or our definition where we said it's uh, anything that causes um, damage to, um, to plants or organisms um, that we value. And then management, so our skilled handling, our, um, our, our decision-making and critical thinking, and our actions. So we're, we're going to take all these different parts from all these different things we know. We're going to bring them together. We're going to do it in the best way possible to get rid of these um, organisms that are causing a problem. All the while making sure that we don't cause any problems that are already worse than what we're dealing with. And so um, when we think about e uh, IPM on a natural resources um, base, so it's an ecosystem based strategy focusing on the long-term prevention of pests uh, or their damage through a combination of techniques uh, such as biological control, habitat manipulation, modification of cultural practices, and the use of resistant varieties. Um, things like pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that they are needed uh, and then we're going to use them according to established guidelines. They are not our first choice of defense. Our first choice of defense would be to figure out something where the um, where the ecosystem could heal itself without having to bring in uh, chemicals. Uh, treatments should usually be made with the goal of removing only the target organism because it's just too hard if you start saying well we got 30 bugs here that are a problem. Well, trying to figure out one chemical or one mixture of stuff that's going to work for all 30 is going to be probably pretty hard. So it's easier to, to pick specific treatments for specific problems. Um, pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes the risk to human health, uh, minimizes risk to beneficial and non-target organisms, and minimizes risk to the environment because we're not trying to cause any more problems than we already have. So in just trying to look at this this graphic we're, we're back to that same idea uh, that we we're talking about before but just this idea we're going to identify the problem uh, we're going to monitor it as well really find out what the problem is and what what we really want to to fix. We're going to evaluate it, make sure we figure out what is our problem, what we're going to do. We're going to do some sort of preventative or some sort of mitigative effort to uh, make sure that we get um, we, we do our best to get rid of the pest or if we're not getting rid of the pest, like in the case of uh, something like bark beetles where we don't want to get rid of the pest because we know it's actually a natural part of the ecosystem, then we're going to reduce it or do our best to reduce it back to a standard that the ecosystem can handle. And then we're going to monitor and then um, see if, where we can improve our, our um, system, improve our management, uh, and just continually try and get better while, like we said on the slide before, minimizing risk to human health, minimizing risk to beneficial and non-target organisms and minimizing risk to the environment or the ecosystem itself. 
So how does it work? So what are we trying to really do? What are what are our values behind behind trying to do integrated pest management? So we're going to focus on long-term prevention of pests or their damage by managing the ecosystem. We're going to monitor and correct um, correctly um, correct pest identification. Um, monitoring and our correct pest identification, excuse me, will help us decide whether management is needed because that's important to understand. Sometimes we will need to to intervene and sometimes we won't. And maybe there's other things we can do to manipulate the ecosystem in order to um, reduce a population. Um, and the real idea, the integrated part of integrated pest management is we want to combine management techniques and management ideas to get greater effectiveness when it taught, when we're, when we're coming up with our, our control strategies. And so there's, there's four main control methods, um, when we're in our action phase of integrated pest management, which are cultural controls, site physical controls, biological controls, and then chemical controls. And so in, in this combination of management approaches, it's really important to know too that um, sometimes it's going to be all these things. Sometimes it's going to be one of these things. Sometimes it's going to be a, some sort of combination of these things. It really depends on what is going to work best for, to, to reduce or eliminate that pest or disease while minimizing the risk to humans, minimizing the risk to beneficial and non-target organisms, minimizing the risk to the environment or ecosystem. So biological controls, what does that mean? So we wanna use natural enemies, predators, parasites, pathogens, competitors, to control the pests and their damage. Uh, invertebrate, uh, pl invertebrates, plant pathogens, nematodes, weeds, invertebrates have many natural enemies. So we wanna be able to, to put those in place. So, um, one of the uh, easiest ones I always think about with uh, with houses uh, is that um, people people don't like having um, mice in their house. Uh, well, one of the things that you could do is if you don't like having mice, make sure you have a uh, a yard that is um, habitable for snakes because snakes eat mice. But I don't want snakes or mice. Well, yeah. Well, maybe then I also have a dog because then the dog. Like or a cat, and the cat likes to kill snakes. The snakes like to kill the mice. I've got this nice um, food web happening to where I don't have that as a problem. Um, one of the things that I'm big on in my own house is making sure that um, daddy long leg spiders aren't aren't getting killed in my house because those spiders eat the other spiders. So I want the daddy long legs around to make sure that all the other spiders aren't hanging out in the house. Uh, cultural controls. Let me move myself up out of the way here. Over to this side. There we go. So, uh, cultural controls. Practices that reduce pest establishment, reproduction, dispersal, and survival. So, an example of this would be changing your irrigation practices can reduce uh, pest problems since too much water can increase root disease and weeds. So, um, I noticed that I've got a lot of weeds popping up and I've been watering quite a bit lately. If I change my irrigation pattern and um, have less water, maybe those weeds can't survive without that extra bit of water. It's just that's that sort of idea in terms of cultural controls. Um, one of the, the biggest ones for when I was down in the southeast is people would have a problem with ticks and said that they didn't like having ticks around. Well, one of the big things with ticks is the way that they um, get on to you is that they basically climb the tallest thing that they can get on, and then as you walk by, they'll latch on. So where do you get ticks? You get ticks in tall grass and areas with shrubs. So if you had a yard in the southeast and you don't want ticks, very simply, keep your grass tiny. Don't have a bunch of shrubs. Big tall trees, very tiny grass, no ticks. So with mechanical and physical controls, um, you're trying to kill a pest directly, block a pest out, or make the environmental, uh, sorry, the environment unsuitable for it. Uh, trapping rodents uh, would be an example of a mechanical control. 
um, in terms of uh, physical control, the idea of um, how in Texas right now they're um, they're having people um, actually pay to go and hunt um, and hunt and kill feral hogs. That's a that's a physical control. Um, other examples uh, using uh, mulch for weed management, steam sterilization of the soil for disease management, or uh, just the idea of having even stuff like um, screens at your house to keep birds or insects out, or if you live in Florida, screens around your patio to keep alligators uh, out of your backyard in your pool. Uh, chemical controls. So this is where we're actually talking about the use of pesticides. Um, could be um, in pesticides, we have all sorts of different subcategories like herbicides, um, fungicides, uh, rodenticides, all sorts of um, different uh, chemicals targeted to reduce certain populations of pests. Um, so when we're, when we're talking about pesticides, pesticides should be selected and applied in a way that minimizes their possible harm to people, uh, non-target organisms, and the environment, because that's when we're talking about our management, that is our biggest, uh, biggest thing that we're trying to accomplish to not hurt anything except for our desired targeted pest. And so in this example right here, methods of IPM uh, control. So we've got our, our biological controls, our cultural and physical controls, and our chemical controls. Um, so some examples uh, for biological controls. We could introduce a predator, as it shows right here, the cat with the mouse, um, or we can limit the habitat. Uh, with cultural and physical controls, we can put uh, barriers or traps out with chemical controls, uh, pesticides, herbicides, soaps, things like that that could um, that could change uh, or reduce the number of pests. And then we've got this pyramid here because there's a lot more biological controls and a lot more ways we can do cultural and physical controls than actual chemical controls. And we should try and use these other controls much more than than the chemical controls if we can because that it provides us a better chance to reduce um, problems to human health, um, beneficial and non-target organisms, and the environment. So another look at this kind of pyramid of IPM tactics. So um, the way that this is set up, so cultural controls are um, hopefully very easy to do and um, can be pretty easy. So some examples um, that this this um, graphic provides. So good sanitation, habitat modification, having a resistant stock. Those are good cultural controls in terms of physical and mechanical, uh, having barriers, trap crops, screens, proper clothing, those sorts of things to keep out uh, pests. Your biological controls, predators, parasites, those sorts of things. And then your chemical controls, your repellents, your diatomaceous earth, your sulfur, microbials, all these things that um, um, are also out there. And then we can even go way up there in terms of our pesticides. And they give some examples of some different pesticides. Um, important to think about the idea of when we're looking at these cultural controls and going to chemical controls, we're going kind of more from the idea of prevention to actual intervention where we've got to actually change, we're going to actually change something in the ecosystem or, um, or really um, possibly get much closer to, uh, to having uh, a, nemesis, a nemesis effect type of event happening. And then we're also increasing in toxicity, which we definitely don't want to do because the more toxicity that there is, the better chance that we um, end up harming humans or beneficial or non-target organisms or the environment. So we want to be as close to prevention as we can and as far away from intervention and toxicity as we can to really be able to say that we um, put our best foot forward and really try to help the ecosystem as much as we can without causing it harm. And then uh, on the right hand side here, uh, it goes through the same process, but it does it specific uh, to beekeeping, just to give you an, uh, a more specific example of how uh, IPM is uh, put in place. 
So with IPM programs, um, there's, there's kind of six basic principles uh, which are combined to create um, the majority of IPM programs. So each situation is different, but the six major components are usually there. Usually you got pest identification, monitoring and assessing pest numbers and damage. You come up with uh, guidelines for when management action is needed or it's part of our evaluation pro process. Um, you're going to prevent pest problems, and the way that we're going to prevent pest problems is we're going to use a combination of the biological, cultural, physical, mechanical, and chemical management tools. And then after our action is taken, our mitigation action, we're going to assess the effect of our pest management and then continue our monitoring the whole time. So just another way to look at that diagnosis, diagnosis and detection. Uh, and our pest identification and also uh, beneficial pet I, um, identification. So we want to make sure we know what our pests are and we also want to make sure we know what um, organisms we have in the ecosystem that will be beneficial and maybe even help us get rid of that pest or just beneficial that we don't want to get rid of. We've got our monitoring and our assessment. We've got our understanding of the pest and beneficial biology and life cycles. We are going to develop a control strategy. We're going to implement that control strategy, and then we're going to evaluate our level of control and make sure, are we doing enough? Are we doing too little? Are we um, getting the results that we want? And we're going to continue that process and refine that process until it gets better and better. And so really, what does I, IPM or integrated pest management come down to? It comes down to just the idea that we want to prevent the buildup of pests, or if we already have the buildup of pests, reduce the that buildup of pests. We want to monitor our, our crops or our wildlands for pests and uh, and also natural control mechanisms, ways that just be on the lookout also for ways to be able to, to put pests in check and reduce our problems. And then we're going to intervene when control measures are needed. We're not going to intervene and we're not going to go straight to pesticides just because um, we want to. We want to make sure we make the best choice for the environment in order to uh, best keep humans, beneficial and non-target organisms, and the ecosystem as healthy as we can because we know that we are all part of the ecosystem and that little ecosystems tie into big ecosystems and that this planet is one huge ecosystem and that we all have this effect on each other. So we want to do our best to, um, to solve our problems without creating any other problems.